capital, which is one of the largest departments in that very important organization. He served in many positions in the organization. He has been chief shop steward, negotiating committee for master contracts. He's been chairman of the COPE committee, which is the political action fund. He has edited newsletters. He has served as a trustee and executive board member of a number of their major units. Now in his department, these are some of the people which he represents. The Commercial Workers International Union, including professional employees, international union, hotel employees, and restaurant employees. And he has served in many of the uh, area offices at a lower level. He's been secretary treasurer. He's been public relations director and serves on 17 different committees in that organization and also has a very active life in the community in which he lives working and serving with the Boy Scouts of America. And it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce to you Robert Barhart. Thank you, Devon. After the introduction, I should just have you stand and have you clap a little, and I'll have the photographer take a picture and then just go home. <clears throat> Officers, department directors, and members of NFO, one and all, farmers of dignity from a time-honored profession. Devon Woodland, what, a, what an appropriate name. Woodland. They tell me he's a guy who knows the difference between the trees and the forest, and that's important in these times. I'm glad you mentioned the Boy Scouts, Devon, because I, I understand we share a common interest there. I happen to serve on the National Advisory Board and also I'm chairman of the National Labor Advisory Council. And I think it's an important aspect of life to be involved in for all of us. It pertains, just as your organization does and as does ours, pertains to the future of this country. I also would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge my good friend Chuck Fraser. For those of you who may not know, the name Chuck Fraser is a well-respected name around the capital of these United States. And I know that Chuck must have felt the same way as I did when I first went to D.C., and that is that I thought that all the brains were located in D.C., and I found out when I got there they're just as dumb as I am. Incidentally, I should call one thing to your attention. Some folks from AMPI in Mid-America and CMPC have inquired and wanted to know why there's never any nice words about them on Here's Info. <laughs> I must tell you that as the son of parents who both come from small farming backgrounds in Pennsylvania, I feel very much at home here. My folks, I think, endowed me with a great deal of common sense. And as best exemplified, I can recall about a year and a half ago when I was at Harvard addressing the Harvard Law students. And after about three hours of discussion and debate with these students, and it was in an amphitheater-like setting, there was one young man up on the top who just kept hammering away at me couldn't shut him up. <coughs> he said, I don't understand how you're going to do what you're talking about. And finally, after trying to provide an answer, for about 45 minutes in exasperation, I said to him, look, all I can tell you is my mother told me when I was a kid that you'll never get to Harvard, and all I can tell you, pal, here I is. I also owe credit to my grandparents who were in the farming business because they were the people who taught me that farmers raise everything except prices. 
I also want to thank all of you, members of NFO, for holding your convention in a hotel that has a collective bargaining agreement with its employees. And on their behalf, I thank you because they appreciate that. Someone asked me if I knew the difference between UFO and NFO. I can assure you that I do. A UFO is always a mystery. A UFO you can never find, especially when you need it. Of course, that's a lot like the present administration in Washington. But the NFO, that's a different story. You always know where NFO is. I know that you began as a protest movement, a dollar in the hat protest movement, back in 1955. And all that I can tell you is, I like people who put their money where their mouth is, and people who join together to protest injustice and work in their own best interest. And my hat is off to all of you. I'm proud to bring you greetings and to be here representing the AFL-CIO and the 13 and a half million members of the world's largest free, and that's important, I underline free, trade union organization, all of whom are engaged in collective bargaining and very much like you are under siege during these times. I have to apologize on behalf of much of labor because sometimes we feel like the sole surviving heir to the Jeffersonian democracy and principles. But we forget that it was of the farmer that Jefferson said, those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, if ever he had a chosen people. Jefferson, I think if he had been around for the Industrial Revolution, would praise and defend both the yeoman farmer and the yeoman worker. Permit us the conceit of thinking that we share the Jeffersonian mantle with you. The NFO and organized labor have worked on the same side of many issues. And I'm here today to express my honest belief that what we have in common far outweighs what divides us. And that's extremely important to understand. When we divided, when we're divided, we bring joy to the hearts of our mutual foes, the merchants of grain, the banks, the conglomerates. In short, those who gleefully exploit you at the production end and then exploit us at the processing and distribution end. Let me just tell you a little bit about us, who we represent at the Food and Allied Service Trades Department, whose acronym happens to be FAST. And that's not fast food, that's fast track. We are a constitutional department of the AFL-CIO, which covers 15 national and international unions that represents nearly 4 million working men and women. The people we represent, as our name indicates, are primarily engaged in food processing and service industries. We represent the grain millers who move and store your wheat, corn, and soybeans. We represent the meat cutters and butchers who turn your livestock into bacon and steaks. We represent the bakers and confectioners who bake the breads and cakes. We represent the tobacco workers who manufacture your tobacco into cigarettes. We represent the retail workers who shelve and sell your food in stores. We represent the waiters and the waitresses who serve your food, the bartenders who pour your alcohol products, and the distillery workers who make them. In short, without you, without your products, we wouldn't exist. Speaking of alcohol, a friend of mine once advised me that there's only one way to get rich farming. And that is to sell your corn as whiskey, your potatoes as vodka, your barley as beer, your sorghum as rum. And if that's true, we're all in trouble. <laughs> the NFO has been a good friend of labor. 
You were instrumental in defeating the right to work legislation in Missouri a few years back. And from food stamps to school lunches to high interest rates to monetary policy, we are fighting side by side. Yet, yet in the hearts of many, and to the delight of corporate America, somehow we are postured as adversaries. It's the old game of playing the middle against the two ends, play them off one against the other. There is, in fact, though, one difference between farmers and workers, and that is that farmers don't go to work. They wake up surrounded by it. Now you are told that your tractors are so expensive because of union wages. And we are told that food costs so much because of farm price supports and farmers manipulating supply to keep prices high. On both sides, the consumers are played off against the producers and the middlemen laugh all the way to the bank. Don't believe the fallacy that we take from each other's slice of the pie or you'll be like the farmer, the farmer with two windmills, who pulls down one because he's afraid there won't be enough wind for both of them. <laughs> who is kidding who? Who's taking the pie? Ask yourself. What has increased more in the past decade? Food and labor costs, or interest rates, energy costs, and fertilizer. Wall Street is riding an unprecedented wave of prosperity, but farmers and workers are still in the trough of the worst depression since the 1930s. You know that hard times have brought farmers and workers together throughout the nation's history. Farm labor coalitions have resulted in some of our most significant agrarian and social reforms. Hard times paint a clearer picture of who is exploiting whom and who is on top and who is on the bottom of the heap. It's the workers and the farmers left at the bottom of the heap together, waiting for the Reaganomics trickle-down theory, which will never come waiting for the Wall Street recovery to reach our farms and our factories, and it never comes. We have unprecedented hunger and starvation, and yet this administration cuts back on food stamps and nutrition programs and pays you farmers to idle your land rather than to devise a delivery system that will let you produce to your capacity and feed the world's hungry at the same time. We've got a president, a Hollywood actor, if you will, who can't make up his mind whether he wants to shoot the Russians or feed them. He wants to keep our markets open for subsidized Japanese goods without doing anything about Japanese exclusion of our meat and citrus products. He's made huge cuts in our taxes and social programs and yet increased by half again our military spending. After creating $200 billion deficits for the foreseeable future, the president has the gall to say that he supports a balanced budget constitutional amendment. I ask you, who's play acting? Who's play acting? And now, OMB Budget Director David Stockman has turned his axe on farm programs. I think it's time for farmers to ask, is Reagan a friend of the farmer or a friend of big agribusiness? Do his policies favor exports or imports, debtors or bankers, Main Street or Wall Street? Labor found out a long time ago that Reagan is no friend, 
And what I'm suggesting to you, the small farmers and ranchers of America, is that he may not be a friend of yours either. Your best friends are sitting here beside you, and your best friends are those who feel similar to you. Some of the people who want to call us friends, I'd hate to be in a foxhole with. I guarantee you. What brings me here today is more than a commonality in substantive issues, more than a common set of adversaries in Washington and on Wall Street. I am here because we share a process, a process that is the core of both of our organizations, without which we would both perish, and that is collective bargaining. Together, we both deeply believe in and are dedicated to the pursuit of collective bargaining. Farmer and worker alike have learned many hard, bitter lessons as to how individuals are treated at the hands of giant corporations. Pitting friend against neighbor, brother against sister, in desperate price and wage exploitation has always been the preferred method of doing business, and that's where the easiest profits are. And yet, those titans of industry scream foul when we join together and stand shoulder to shoulder and ask for a fair return of our labor. How dare you, they cry. How dare you? How dare you ask anything from us? They say, we'll tell you what a fair return on your labor is. It's a constant battle, one that's far from over and far from won. I'm not saying that it's easy. When farmers hold back their products for a fair price, they see their neighbors slinking off to the market for a nickel less a bushel. And when the worker has enough and goes on strike and his neighbor takes his place on the job for less money, do you think we don't have a similar problem? I don't know what farmers call price cutters, but I can tell you what we call strike breakers. And perhaps Jack London's description of a scab is the best one. I quote, after God had finished the rattlesnake, the toad, and the vampire, he had some awful looking stuff with which he made a scab. And when the scab comes down the street, men turn their backs, and angels weep in heaven. And even the devil shuts the gates of hell to keep out a scab. Think about that. I know how difficult it is to band people together with the promise of something better someday. How do you convince a worker he's better off staying out on strike? when his neighbor is working his job and he's three months behind in his mortgage? How do you convince the farmer that he should hold back his crop for a better price when his neighbor is selling for less and the banker is knocking at the door? I'll tell you how. It's a ten-letter word called solidarity which now, because of the Polish situation, has come back into vogue. Solidarity is what makes or breaks collective bargaining, and achieving solidarity should be our mutual goal. As I told you, the NFO has a great lobbyist in Chuck Frazier, and organized labor has a cadre of fine lobbyists who prowl the halls of Congress, but I can tell you this, if you and you and you and I don't do everything within our power to win over the doubters, to organize the unorganized, 10,000 lobbyists won't make any difference. If there are farmers willing to sell for less, workers willing to work for less, 
our organizations will lose, our members will lose, and the merchants of grain, the merchants of greed, will again be the winners. It's not a simple task, organizing all the farmers together in one camp, nor organizing the industrial workers and the service workers in another camp. Believe me, that's no simple task in itself. Our common foe is a mighty one. But if the farmer and the worker are united together, we have a better chance than if we're pitted against each other because we'll cancel each other out. Here's an example of a mutual problem caused by a mutual foe. Since 1977, there have been over 140 grain elevator explosions that have killed over 100 workers and injured hundreds of others. The cause of this explosion is clear. It's the accumulation of grain dust, which is pound for pound more explosive than TNT. Now, all of a sudden, this administration thinks that it's a big mystery, this explosion problem, when the solution has been right in front of us for 30 years. The National Academy of Science has recommended limiting grain dust to 1 64th per square foot. And the Occupational Safety and Health Administration has drafted a proposed rule of 1 8th square inch. But the grain elevator industry is convinced OMB, our friend again, David Stockman, to sit on the standard for the last six months while pressuring OSHA to gut the standard entirely. So here's the picture. You deliver your clean grain to the elevator. The elevator dot does not only not control the explosive dust, but in fact adds tons of it to your product. And I'm talking about grain dust being put back in. The grain dust frequently explodes, killing your brothers and cousins working in the elevators and our grain millers are dying, your product is contaminated, and the elevator conglomerates laugh about the grim profit they reap. Why don't we join hands and do something about it? Another mutual problem we face is the specter of bankruptcies. Sound like a familiar word? Thousands of farmers have gone bankrupt during this administration plowed under your farms and equipment, put on the sheriff's auction block, your hopes and security crushed under the lion's paw. I ask you, is this a Hollywood script they're writing or what? It may be a Hollywood script in Washington, but it's a nightmare all across America for workers and farmers. Likewise, the same policies and indifference have caused thousands of companies to close their doors forever. And several million workers face a dark future with little hope of employment and almost no chance of retraining. Many have exhausted their unemployment benefits, have no health insurance, and the banks are foreclosing on their home mortgages. These are such compassionate people, these bankers. Talk about angels of mercy. <sighs> and then we've got a president walking around talking about a humdinger of a recovery program. Well, we've got a humdinger, all right, but he's from Hollywood, and he happens to live in Washington, and I hope he's not going to be there too much longer. <clears throat> I ask you the question. Why is a little belt tightening good for us when it operates like a noose around our neck? It operates like a noose for farmers and workers. Why are the real interest rates, the difference between what the bank charges and the inflation rate, higher than ever before in our nation's history? How can we let the banks harvest a bumper crop of profit when it's at our expense? 
It's out of our hides. Only together can we change the focus and the concerns of our representatives in Washington. <coughs> Only together can we chase the money changers from the temples of government. Only together can we change our nation's course back to the Jeffersonian concern for the little guy and for women's rights for the little gal. If anyone is the symbol of the rugged individual, it has to be the American farmer. The myth of the individual dies hard, but die it must. It's the men at the top of the pyramid leering down at us and telling us not to band together into a force that can deal with them, urging us to be individuals. Very simple reason why, because they want to pick us off one by one. I say to you, let's say N-O. Let's stand together and negotiate as equals to achieve what we all deserve. A fair day's pay for a fair day's work. Is that so wrong? Is that radical? Today's socioeconomic fabric is so tightly woven we can no longer afford to view ourselves as distinct interest groups. We are all vulnerable to the same trends, threats, booms, and busts. Missouri is in the same media market as Washington, D.C., and interest rates on Wall Streets have an immediate impact in Des Moines. Gone are the clear stereotypes of city slickers and rubes. We produce and consume each other's goods, one group totally dependent upon the other. And we have to deal with the market forces that are capable of crushing us as individuals. So unite we must, or divided we will fail. Again, Abraham Lincoln, a farmer's son, noted that the strongest bond of human sympathy outside the family relation should be one uniting all working people of all nations, of all tongues and kindreds, and we're both working people, the toil of our hands. Let us today begin and understand Mr. Lincoln's common bonds. Together we can nurture and forge a stronger bond and march side by side into the 21st century. Nor will we forget the words of Daniel Webster, when tillage begin, other arts follow. The farmers, therefore, are the founders of human civilization. Remember this, founders. You get what you take, and you keep what you have the strength to hold. This morning at breakfast, when I walked in, there was a lady who I'm sure is sitting out here in the audience, who was at the breakfast table with bowed head, saying her prayers. And it reminded me of an old Indian prayer. Lord, the world is so bad. Make it better, beginning with me. Solidarity forever. Thank you very much. <laughs>